On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome back to the program after uh, really too long, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mike Consigal, from a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. Welcome to the program, Mike. It has been too long. Thanks for having me on. Uh, now, let me just now let me just say that um, I am very proud of the fact that on this program we're going to be able to spend as much time to something that some people would perceive as. A, an obscure fight that is taking place um, in sort of very narrow economic circles. But the, the implications of the rogoff reinhardt study uh, have been rather large in terms of the shadow that that study has cast on our, our policies and uh, or at least the justifications for our policies uh, and specifically the austerity, uh, the policies of austerity that we have been subjected to in this country and um, in Europe, frankly, over the past couple of years. Just tell us um, what the rogoff reinhardt study is. So um, Kenneth Rogoff is an economist at uh, Harvard, uh, also with the IMF. He was a very uh, uh, affiliated with the IMF. Carmen Reinhardt is also uh, an economist. Um, they wrote a paper in 2010. Now, if you remember back to 2010, there was a big debate about should there be an additional round of stimulus, um, what should be done in Europe in particular. And they wrote a paper that said if you get above 90 percent debt to GDP, which is to say if your debt's approaching what you make in one year, which is what uh, the U.S. Uh, debt was approaching and sooner would have come to, and what Europe had already gone past, you have a real decline in growth. Um, you know, growth drops off from what it would normally be. On average, which this is one of their big headline reports, is that it would go negative. And crucially, they pitched this as almost like a cliff, right? Like, it was, it was a zone that once you were in, it wasn't that it just got a little bit worse. Uh, it, it got you know, significantly worse. So it was really a danger zone to be avoided. This had a real outsized impact on the debate and convinced, I mean, there's a lot of people who wanted austerity and were willing to take whatever excuse they had. But I think there's a lot of like, especially centrist Democrats who were nervous about stimulus and nervous about debt to GDP. And this gave them an excuse to go much harder against, um, you know, trying to do something about unemployment and slow growth. Tim Fernholds um, recounts uh, that a, uh a passage from a book by Senator Tom Coburn on, on U.S. debt. And he recounts the time where um, Rogoff and Reinhardt uh, met with 40 senators. I mean, that's, you know, 40 senators. That's a, a big deal um, in 2011. And the exchanges that took place there where Rogoff, um, you know, where Johnny Isaacson uh, said, do we need to act this year? Is it better to act quickly? Absolutely, Rogoff said. Not acting moves the, the risk closer. You have very few levers at this point, uh, he warned us. It went on to say that um, uh, Ken Conrad seemed to really absorb what uh, Rogoff was saying, that this was going to diminish our GDP, um, our, our growth rather, by 25 to 33 um, percent. You had um, uh, Tim Geithner, who was the secretary treasurer at the time, saying it's an excellent study, although in some ways maybe it's understated. Uh, um, you yeah, had, you he, he lists all of it. it um, the, that 90 percent threshold is cited in Paul Ryan's budget. Uh, European Commissioner Ollie Wren uh, cites it. I mean, on and on and on. It's cited over and over again. And I will just tell you that from a non wonk uh, from a non sort of like policy perspective, my um, my brother in law who, you know, God bless him, is, uh, you know, sort of uh, just uh, absorbs things rather quickly um, and is a business guy, considers himself one of those sort of non-ideological people, states this over and over again, this mantra. I don't know if he knows the names, uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt, but this has had incredible impact, at least in our, po our politics, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then remember, there isn't, like, you know, Events like the Great Depression, like the Great Recession we just went through, don't happen very often, right? So we often don't know about what happens to economies when they go into it. So, I mean, even though the conventional sense is still true, right, like, like the Federal Reserve is having trouble acting, so fiscal stimulus we know will boost employment, um, the idea of debt really far out there is, is kind of unknown, right? The last time the United States had this was during the end of the Great Depression when we were ramping up for World War II and also had massive full employment uh, and perfect growth. So there's not 
really like a, a good set of data sets. So the fact that two really, you know, eminent, preeminent economists really put this out there, and then also they're denying this now, aggressively put muscle into it. I mean, as you said, they met with 40 senators, which how often do people get to meet with 40 senators, uh, is really telling I me. Mean, it was really an important intellectual building block of, of the global movement towards austerity in the early 2010s. Okay, so now... Um you write a piece yesterday that basically summarizes, in some respects, a, a study by three um, economists from UMass, uh, and people referring to them as a uh, ham. Uh, it's and it and it essentially takes apart um, this the Reinhardt Rogoff um, uh, study. And, and other people have done that in the past, and we'll talk about the problems they've had. But why don't you list for us uh, but who it was that did that study and what they found and why, why their study is unique in terms of uh, having access to the original data. So um, there is always a question about the causation, right? You always hear correlations, not causation. The correlation they found, there's always a big debate about whether or not Reinhardt and Rogoff were finding, were essentially reading their, their results backwards and whether or not a weak economy was causing higher debt, which makes perfect sense. Um, but no one had been able to reproduce the data or reproduce their results. Most of the data, in fact, all of it by, by now, has been publicly available, but their methodology is really opaque in the paper. Um, they don't use all the data. Um, they, it's not clear how they do stuff. And so no one's actually been able to replicate it to take apart the pieces and show, you know, reporters who are very influenced by this results how it works. Finally, three researchers at UMass Amherst. Um, uh, Thomas Hernan, uh, Michael Ash, and ba Robert Pollan, um, brilliant, brilliant economists. Um, they they were able to get the action. One of them spent basically a year trying to reverse engineer it, could not do it. So they finally got them, uh, Reinhard and Rogoff, to send their original spreadsheet. And then it was very clear what they were doing and why no one was able to replicate it. Okay, so let's go through. There were essentially three problems they found with uh, the Reinhardt Rogoff study, and um, the, the the sort of save the most sort of like spectacular one, I guess, and the most flamboyant uh, error for last. It may be the the least significant in some respects, but in other respects, I happen to think it's the most significant. But 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 take us through those uh, those three problems that they found. Sure. So the first two have to do with the data. The um the they Reinhardt and Rogoff do not use periods in the 1940s and the early 1950s for several countries that have both high debt loads and high growth. Canada is one. Um, New Zealand they exclude all the years that were high growth and and high debt and just took the last year which actually had very low growth like negative seven percent like a like a very severe recession. New Zealand's a very small country even at that point so the fact that they're weighing it against the United States for instance I think is really problematic but the crucially they they, they exclude certain years in a way that seems incredibly problematic. The second is that right, wait, they now, let me weigh say, I just want to dwell on that for a second so, so that people understand what what you're saying here is that. They have, the, theoretically, the data set that they can use, right, uh, goes back, I guess, um, 100 to 115 years or so, uh, and they choose specific, uh, <laughs> specific data set that, um, that, that seems pretty arbitrary and capricious, right? I mean, it's like, why, why this year as opposed to that year? Uh, they're, they're, it's, it's sort of, uh, I mean... Could anybody make any heads or tails about it when they've responded to this? I mean, do they explain why we chose to use these years and not those years? Especially for their headline results, the one that all the congressmen were worried about, um, they, they look from essentially the mid-40s onward. Uh, so it's only 100, I think it's 110 data points that are actually really high debt of, of you know, 20 countries or so. Um, and they throw out 15 immediately. So this is a substantial part of the set, right? This is, you know, about 10 or 15 percent of the data set is tossed. And they all tend to be years with high growth and high debt. And it's, um, I mean, that's really problematic. I mean, it's, and it's very obvious. And it, it, it has <laughs> yes, a significant very, effect on the final, final thing. It's very now, the problematic. The second thing they do is they, they weigh it in such a way, which is to say, 
you, you know, it's always difficult. You have to, as, an, as you know, someone who's working with data, you have to make decisions about what counts and what doesn't and how you're, you know, weighing things or what, what are you trying to compare. They compare countries overall. So, for instance, the one year of New Zealand they find that's really bad is given the equal weight of 19 years in in England in the UK that has you know two and a half percent growth on average it's actually a pretty good pretty good run of high debt for them and they say you know one's negative seven percent one's two and a half percent therefore you know it averages out to negative four percent or whatever it would be negative three percent because it has equal weighting it's a really obtuse way to weight it and it's obviously the weighting you'd use if you really wanted to amplify small and consequential one-off years like from a small country like New Zealand I, I mean I look I am I am not good at math and I um, I mean there, there, I, I can't imagine anyone I know who is further whose whose abilities in these areas um, uh, is, uh, is 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 less than mine. Uh, who's willing to actually even entertain a conversation about it? But it seems to me that if you have 19 years of a major, uh, you know, one of the largest economies in the world, um, functioning with high debt and high growth, and to give that equal balance uh, as New Zealand's one year of uh, high debt, low or uh, negative growth, that just seems. It just seems bizarre to me. Uh, I mean, what, how do they justify that? Um, well, they dance around it. They haven't. They haven't particularly responded. I mean, they've just sent out another thing a little while ago. I'm um, trying to argue about this. I think. So I mean, we'll talk about the third thing as well. I, I, on one hand, you could that you could make an argument for why this might be a good way to weigh it. But the two things that should stand out is one is that they didn't disclose that they were doing this. They did not make their techniques and metho- methodology available to other people. You know, people like Dean Baker, a prominent liberal think tanker, uh, have been asking for years about their methodology and their data, and they've just ignored it. So um, if you know, transparency is ultimately a good disinfectant here. Uh, and so the fact that they weren't disclosing it, and once people started to be able to see what was going on, it was very clear how problematic it was. And it means that they ultimately should have been hedging these statements that they were making to people like senators, people like journalists. I mean, this, these results were widely cited by journalists, which is how it circulated into the greater kind of public discourse, which is why random people would know about this. Um, the fact that that stuff was missing and the third error makes it really, I mean, it's really problematic. 